Thank you for tuning into Stampscaping 101. This is a full page, 8.5 by 11 inch scene that is a simple composition, but it just has a lot of area. I don't do full size scenes very often, but I haven't stamped for a while because I've been working on new designs, but I don't know. I thought, okay, if I'm going to do a scene, I want it big. But I didn't want to think about composition too much, so I went with a very simple composition in terms of uh, creating just a this background kind of lighting type of uh, uh, abstract kind of a color scheme, value scheme too, and just stamping my imagery in black right over the top of it. And then I went back in and I've added some shadows and kind of some detailing uh, effects into it. But otherwise, it's a very easy process, and uh, it's one of those, I mean, you can do it much smaller versions of it, but it'd be a good one to do a stamp along if you'd like. And uh, um, it's all, like I said, it's all a nice, easy process. Um, the thing about it for me is uh, I like to uh, add different types of textures in my water to make it kind of nice and shimmery, so I've added some different types of little subtle things in here, which if you watch the video you'll see, but I have, um, I know I couldn't find my water texture stamp, so I used uh, my Alto Cumulus Cloud in here, down in the water right in here, but it just, I don't know, it adds a little bit of a dimension, I guess a textural dimension, and it's just done in light blue in here. But there's also other things like little, you know, those old rocks down here kind of add to the overall scheme of it but for the most part I think it's about lighting and uh, it's about mood and it's about depth within these spaces right here and I really love using um, pigment ink this is a good video to watch on um, uh, employing um, pigment ink to create kind of a frosty type of misty types of looks within the scene I, I mean I mention all of the, uh, the basics of it anytime I use it but this one you know there's just more scene to it, so I talk about it a little bit more than in, maybe in some videos, but you can see it used down here and in front of the kayak and whatnot. But it all sets up for a kind of a nice, I don't know, for me, kind of an inviting type of, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess a situation, you know, of having a figure on the lake. And uh, like I said, you know, um, you know, in past videos, um, I think scenic stamping is kind of fun because you can kind of take a mini vacation into the uh, the scenes that you create, you know, while you're doing them. You know, you can really get lost in it. And I'm someone that's kind of kinesthetic, so I like to uh, create this little areas of mist, you know, that are being illuminated and they kind of envelop, you know, some of the objects within the scenes. And for me, I think it makes it look a little bit more three-dimensional when you throw something like those little touches in here. Um, little stars in the sky with the gel pens and uh, little highlights down here in the water uh, with those same gel pens. Pretty simple color scheme, you know, it's just your blue tones, okay? But if you want to go with a little bit more of a kind of an inviting type of color scheme, you know, especially when it involves water, what you do is you throw a little bit of a, you know, a greenish tinge into it and it turns it from something that's, you know, maybe looks really inviting and something like that, but it would certainly be cooler um, in temperature, in you know, the overall temperature. So you throw a little bit of green down there and it becomes more warm and tropical and whatnot. So you uh, introduce an element of uh, kind of a variation in temperature by doing so. And by doing so, if you have a little tinge of green and blue, by having them together, it creates this thing called a color glow, you know, by having analogous colors right next to each other uh, within a given space. In this case, it's actually overlapping in some areas, you know, the other colors and whatnot. So anyways, there's my large full page scene. It's not really a card anymore, is it? You know, it's not really card making, but I don't know. Scene making, I guess. So fun to do. And I really enjoyed it. So if you watch the video, I hope you enjoy it too. Okay, we have our 8.5 by 11 full size 
piece of paper, and we're going to see if we can do a relatively quick and easy scene on a very large format as far as card making standards go. I mean, I don't know if we would consider this a, a card, but um, it'll be a piece in the spirit of a smaller card formatted saying, okay? Meaning that I'm just going to be using some of my imagery a little bit more on a larger um, area than a smaller one. But all of these same images can be used, believe it or not, on a quarter page. You just wouldn't use them in their entirety, okay? But we'll get to the composition when we get to that. We have a large area to cover here um, with color. I have a glossy cardstock. Okay, and dye-based inks, okay? And I'm just going to show you this because I want to show you that you can do fairly um, large scenes in a very quick and easy manner, okay? And this is the process that I use for smaller cards too, but uh, to make things go easier, when we're applying so much color down on a large area like this, or even on a smaller area, if you're using a decent amount of ink in the layered dye-based ink um, application process, I like to start with lighter colors, okay? That's if I'm doing, you know, um, a colored scene. You can do also do monochromatics and just use black ink, but usually when I'm going for color, I'm going from light colors and I'm working through a range moving into my darker um, values, okay? But here's the secret here, all right? And I do this on a lot of different videos here, but um, a lot of us don't have ray inkers. We have we buy pads, okay? But um, if you like this process or you like the look of it, one of the things that I like to do is I like to have um, some, one of my lighter colors, my lighter um, values of a popular hue that I use. I use blues all the time, so this one happens to be an ocean aqua. Uh, Adirondack lights um, and Adirondack pads in general from uh, Ranger Industries are discontinued, but things like Memento inks, there's a, a great uh, ink called Summer Sky, but just basically what I'm getting at is if you like blue tones in your scenes, then get a very light blue reinker. Whatever the lightest value is of a given line that you like working with, if you like working with distress colors, there's colors like, um, you know, tumbled glass. Okay, but anyways, getting to the scene right here, what I'm going to do, this is going to be a vertically formatted scene, okay? Like portrait mode, okay? So. 11 inches by eight and a half. And what this is going to look like is it's going to look like a, like a ocean inlet or something like that, or harbor or something like that with islands, okay? I've done this scene before, but I just wanted to do it uh, and see how fast I could do it here. It's taking me a little bit longer because I'm explaining it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this kind of this waterway with these striations, you know, going this way. All right, so I'm working from I have my card like this. It's going to be like this, but I'm working with it like this because this is just the natural way my hand goes, okay? And this is a process that will make things nice and simple for you, okay? You see how much ink is on this tip right here because I've used, you know, a few drops of uh, uh, the reinker fluid. So it just gives me a lot more coverage, okay? And this is very, some people say, oh my gosh, you know, the stylus tools are so hard to, kind of get a feel for it. Well, I mean, I can go like this, right? And if it's on glossy cardstock, I just blend it right across right that. That is not a hard application process. Where it gets a little bit harder is if you have um, kind of drier pads or something like that, and someone goes like this, and it's barely leaving any kind of mark. So what they do is they start scrubbing it back and forth, and that's where you get rips and tears in your uh, pads right here. But if you have enough ink laid down, okay, and you want to start off with a pretty good amount of ink because the first color is not just for, you know, toning, but it's for kind of getting your page and your surface a little bit moist and, you know, the pulp of the paper saturated with a little bit of ink, okay? Now, I'm not necessarily going to, I put a decent amount of ink up, you know, I don't know if that's the top or the bottom right there, but a decent amount of ink overall, okay? And see, that's coverage right there. 
but this is more saturation. You can see it's darker to begin with, okay? Now, if you don't have a rain curtain, you're just, you know, stamping along with me as a kind of like a stamp along process. And certainly, I hope some of you are kind of joining in with me here because this will be a nice, easy project. But what you want to do is, if you don't have a rain curve fluid, you can also put a little drop of water on here. Don't soak it or something like that, but get a pretty decent amount so that when you're doing this, you're kind of slathering your page with it, okay? Now see, that's coverage right there, but if I go a little bit more, it gets just inherently darker, okay? It'll only get dark to a certain point, though, because this is a certain hue, and it's not like we can get to navy blue using, you know, a super, you know, light sky blue ink, okay? But when you use enough of it, it'll reach its kind of its uh, super saturated uh, kind of incarnation, you know, see that's that same ink that's right down here as well. Okay, it's a little bit darker, okay? Just because the pulp of the paper got, you know, a little bit more saturated too, okay? Now, I'm just going to keep going over this and blending it in. Now, if you notice when I'm going on this side of my card, I have it on the top, okay? Now when I'm doing this side, you flip it around, okay? Now this is a natural motion, and that's going to be something that's inherently more comfortable for your hand than doing this type of motion, like pushing, okay? And we're not scrubbing back and forth again. I'm just kind of using this light pressure here. And I can go a little bit harder to watch this. I can squeeze out ink like a mop. And I can go across here too, okay? And that's if you're using that, you know, but don't scrub. I mean, I'm just kind of showing you that as an example of what, you know, re-inkers will allow for, okay? It's just, it's a slippery surface, so you don't end up tearing any of your pads, but use, you know, kind of better technique than my example of, you know, extremes, okay? Now see, I, I can still have a little bit of ink down there. You can squeeze it out. There's a lot of ink that's um, held in these sponge tips right here. After all, it is a sponge, okay? All right, now if you want to have a little bit of light remaining in the center, I would recommend retaining that, and that will read as kind of a reflected light coming from your light source, wherever that might be, um, within your space, your scene, okay? You don't have to have it in the space. It could be, you know, kind of, you know, your light source could be out here shining down in this area or whatnot. But look at this, we got a lot of coverage here, and I was blabbing on and on, but we got a lot of coverage here just with that rain curve. And this is, again, it's like eight and a half by 11, so we're talking about a lot of coverage, so it really makes it a lot easier if you just have a re -inker. Bottle, sometimes, if you're thinking about, it costs more to get re and your pads, but in your lightest tones, if you're using this, I, don't, I never stamp out imagery in colors, you know, not like light blue. Well, sometimes maybe, but not, not my lightest colors, okay? So sometimes you don't even need to get a pad for your lightest colors of, let's say, blue, yellow, and pink. What are those? Those are kind of like primary colors, okay? The lightest incarnations of them, okay? But if you get them in their uh, lightest incarnations, you can even bypass the pads and just go straight for the reinker if you're using it for this purpose of layering your colors, okay? And there's a lot more ink in a reinker bottle than there is in a pad, so um, I don't know how much, five times as much or something like that? And they're the same price usually, okay? The reinkers are usually, you know, as far as price points go, the same as the pads, so. I don't know, I think you get a lot more for your money that way. Everyone loves the look of pads, though. You know, I know they're really nice and kind of cool, you know, pads. These ones are Marvies and they've been discontinued, but, you know, everyone loves the look of pads, so usually get that. But as far as ranking purposes, if you're looking to expand your um, range of colors, you might think about, and you don't have like a light, super light blue or something like that, and you want to do this layering process, then I don't know, think about just going with the reinker uh, bottle of it instead of the pad form. All right, if it's an either or th type of thing, or if you have a certain budget, you know, if you want to get four reinkers or something like that instead of, uh, you know, um, a pad and re of two of the colors, then I would recommend going with that. All right, now this is Caribbean blue. It is darker than 
the previous color, but what I'm doing is I'm not... I mean, I could if I only had like a navy blue or something like that. I could jump to that, you know, and use that, but um, if I have those intermediate colors in between this and a much darker one or a darker one, then go ahead and use it. If it doesn't look like it's getting darker at all, if you go to your next color, um, then just skip to the next darker one, okay? All right, so Caribbean blue, adding it in the same way. Now see this, I'm kind of leaving some areas lighter. It's a little bit more apparent the darker you go. It's a little bit more obvious, okay? Let's see this, I'm starting in the same area. I'm working my way in. Right, and this is what I'm doing too. You notice I'm not doing this. Da, 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 da. Like I'm doing this, you know what I mean? That's when it gets a little bit blotchy. So I'm just working one area. Okay, see that? And I'm kind of dragging that in. As this gets a little bit drier on here, I'm kind of coming a little bit closer or actually into that interior portion. Process is very simple. It's very comfortable on your hand too. All right, what happens is when people try to rush it and they want to get that whole area done, so they're doing more of this type of application like that. And then you see each stroke. You know, this is blending in really easy for me though because I did get that nice saturation down. Okay, so that was just an extreme example of, you know, kind of, you know, an undesirable technique as far as this process goes. Okay, so in other words, just kind of stay in your area like that and take it in nice and easy. Every time I re-ink it, I start on the outside because I'm gonna have this area on the perimeters darker than the interior so that, you know, the wetter your ink is, the more ink that it's going to be applying, and the darker that is going to be as a result, okay? So see, as I go and I lay this down, it's drier and drier, and that's when it's lighter than at its wettest point, you know, when I apply the, you know, um, retrieve the ink or whatever in the sponge. So utilize the drier incarnations of it in your lighter areas, okay? So this is going to represent like reflected light on the surface here. So I wanna keep that lighter, okay, on the interior. I like a nice strong vignette type of look, you know, darker on the perimeter because I think it contains the composition very nicely. Okay, but that is second color and say maybe it gets a little bit darker not really too much okay vary it okay change it around it doesn't have to look like you know symmetrical Let's go to a medium blue. This is kind of like the Memento Bahama blue. Let's take a look and see if it makes any difference. If I don't see any change at all, then just move to your next darker one. Yeah, it's a little bit different. Remember, there's some of the Caribbean blue still in the pad, so it's some kind of mixture of the two of these inks. I'm not worried about mixing my inks. Now, if I was using orange or something like that, I wouldn't do it in this color combination, but let's just say, for example, you're gonna use orange, then you're gonna to wanna to certainly change your tip, okay? Don't use the same tip for that with the, you know, previous color still in there. All right, this is getting a little bit darker. I don't know if you can see the difference between this side and this side. It's a little bit of a change, right? This glossy cardstock now, okay? It's not uh, photo paper like uh, inkjet paper. Inkjet papers would be grabbing this ink much faster and absorbing it and uh, drying, so the kind of this blending process isn't as, you know, smooth with that type of paper. You can use it, but it really requires a lot more ink. We're almost done with the toning process, you know, and it really made, has made 
possible with that ranker. It really coated my paper. It's making it nice and easy to blend in my darker tones. This one's just called blue from Marvy. You can see a little bit of a change. It's a much darker color if I just go like that, right? But see, on my paper right here, because it's fairly wet, the ink isn't transferring quite so fast. Which is kind of what you want. That's why it's allowing me to spread it nice and smoothly. Because it isn't drying quickly. Some people ask me, um, like in this process right here, and, and, you know, this is, you know, if they just see an end result or something like that, or the first video, okay, but they, I've been asked, like, okay, wait, I don't have glossy paper, and I don't have, uh, dye-based inks. Would the same technique work with matte paper and alcohol inks? Well, matte paper is a lot more absorbent, right? And alcohol inks dry very, very quickly, so... It would be kind of be the opposite characteristics of what makes this process easier to do, okay? But that being said, I mean, I told them, I said, well, it's kind of, you know, both your medium there would be the exact opposite of kind of the characteristics that, you know, ideally you would use, but you know, you can do certain things. It requires a different touch, but that doesn't mean that uh, you can't do scenes with alcohol inks on matte cardstock. So it would just look a little bit different, okay? I mean, the, de definitely the touch. I don't know if you'd be able to get these streaks like this, okay? This nice transitioning streaks of dark, you know, light to dark. And it would require a lot more kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I guess practice time or something like that. People think this needs a lot of practice time, and I get it, you know? I mean, if you don't do this and you're just kind of working it out for yourself, okay? But I taught this, people how to do this for, you know, 20 years, you know, in people in the workshops. And as long as you have them start off with that lightest tone, okay? And thicker inks as your base coat are the key there. And, you know, we did this in Make and Takes too, where people kind of just sat in and did it in half, you know, came up with a scene in a half an hour. They were fine. They, were, they got everything down perfectly. But it's just getting people to kind of follow some of those basic principles of getting a nice thick coat as the base coat, and that makes things so much easier um, in the process there, okay? So try to do that, and we don't have everything in hand. So if things are a little bit dry too, then moisten your pad or something like that, or skip some of those intermediate colors and just go to the darker one a little bit sooner, okay? Base coats though, don't forget that. All right, this is going to a Prussian blue. Prussian blue is fairly dark, okay? You can see that how rich that color is and how much of it a plot is even over a fairly saturated surface here, okay? This is the color if you're kind of following along with me and you're using inks other than, say, Marvy. Marvy inks are a little bit thinner, so they kind of transfer onto the paper, even though I put kind of a thicker ink in the form of the Ranger Industries types of inks, um, Distress inks, um, um, Adirondacks, Sea Brights, I, I, I can't even remember all the names of there, but most inks out there are fairly thick mementos, okay? All right, the Marvy inks are thinner, so it allows me to put some inks down. If it doesn't, if it doesn't seem like it's getting any darker, all right, the more you put down, it's because you're using thick over thick over thick, so it's not applying as much. So that being said, all you have to do is just let your page set up a little bit, allow it to kind of sit for five minutes before applying your next color, maybe. I don't know, it depends, you know, the relative humidity to your area, how fast is your inks kind of evaporating, you know, the moisture in them and drying. 
but you might have to let them set up a little bit and uh, before you start applying your next color. Uh, you could heat set it or something like that. Don't you know apply a ton of uh, you know a, a huge amount of uh, heat to it. Yeah, you know just sit there like you're embossing or anything like that. But you can dry things a little bit faster that way. But the thing is, is that you don't want it completely dry. Okay, you just don't want it sopping wet. Okay. But you do want it a little bit moist, so that allows for you to apply your inks in a nice, kind of smooth manner because you're applying kind of wet, you know, into damp, okay? If it's completely dry, it tends to grab a little bit more, okay? And it sets up faster, okay? But in something like this, you know, you can see this. I mean, if I do that, that is set. Well, this is matte paper right here, but. See this right here on my piece of paper like this? I mean, I think if I go like that, it allows me to spread it out, right? Because it's glossy paper. And it is moist as well, okay? So, so that's what makes it really easy. If you make the process easier for yourself, then, you know what I mean? It's just kind of less touch that's required, okay? You know, if my paper, if my inks are drying a little bit too fast and I'm getting, you know, shapes like this or something like that, then just stay in that area a little bit longer, okay? Spread it out, blend it, okay? And it's fine, okay? I mean, I can do that on here too. Like, here's a matte paper, it's completely dry. But let's say I wanted to get some kind of softer touch. See, like that? I mean, this is, you know. This is basically what's going on on my glossy paper here. I'm getting this transition right here going from dark to light like that. And see, and I don't have like shapes like that everywhere because I take my time and I just lightly t dab it on like this. So you use kind of touch with your hand, you know, as far as your pressure goes. And you can get this nice smooth transition. Okay, now this is the darkest color that I happen to be using the thinnest color, you know, that Prussian blue. And I'm working it on matte cardstock, and you can get that. And I don't have any rips on this, okay? Just don't, you know, don't rush it. You know, just uh, take your time, and you can get a nice, easy transition of values working like that, okay? And it's, you know, I can do that here, but I mean, so could people in the classes and making takes and stuff like that, you know? You just kind of keep people from doing like this type of thing. Okay, that's that's the thing that, that's the, you know, pretty much the only thing you have to avoid right there. And then don't scrub back and forth, okay? That's for the health of your tips there. But let's see, you know, we're almost getting there um, on this scene. Uh, to me, I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, I might want, I kind of wanted to go for a little bit of a warmer tinge, you know, in here, kind of an aqua uh, blue. So I think I'm going to do that. Sometimes it makes it look, well, temperature warmer, but when you kind of increase the temperature, sometimes it looks a little bit more inviting, you know, kinesthetically, you know, visually kinesthetic, like you want to kind of jump in there and... I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to go for a swim, but, you know, um, but you'd certainly like to be out there on a kayak or boat or something like that, or just looking across there. It's just really quite inviting, you know, when you see some kind of like warm turquoise green, turquoise blueish, you know, looking, uh, you know, uh, water, um, waterway. Yeah, it's just very, very inviting. All right, so we have that, right? Kind of looks a little bit psychedelic to me. Um, all right, let me see here. Let's pick out a color. I need to buy some more pads, believe it or not. There are some gaps in my color schemes. I probably have 60 colors, I don't know, something give or take. But I don't use all of them. I use a lot of them, but uh, I don't use all of them. This is a pale green, but eh. so I don't know. I'm looking on my shelf now. I maybe my turquoise one kind of uh, died. 
No, here's turquoise right here. I, I guess I'm thinking of a different color. Maybe uh, there was a bottle green or something. Okay, but anyways, let's just get into this um, here. All right, let me see something here. Ooh, this one's really starting to disintegrate. This is a 20-year-old pad. Now well, let me see if I can get one more use out of it. It's kind of getting kind of crumbled here on the surface, so um, you can see it. That's what happens when your pads start going bad. Just don't scrub on it. You might be able to get some more use out of it. Okay. Let's see. Okay, I'm just using this tip, this sponge right here. This will be a good example of you know, kind of making do. I, I didn't clean off my uh, my uh, stylus tools, and I have a gigantic pile of them that I really need to wash off. But oh, okay. See this right here. Um, blending it in. Look at that. Look at that green in there. It's going to change there. See how it glows. Um, colors on the color wheel, the colors that are right next to each other on a color wheel, if you kind of know this, the, uh, the basics of uh, how a color wheel is kind of uh, formatted. The colors that are right next to each other on something like that are called analogous colors. And when you put analogous colors next to one another, in this case I'm kind of overlapping it too, but it is kind of night next to it because I am running some of this into that green, uh, white area. So it reads as just pure this color, pale green. Um, analogous colors next to one another create a color glow, and that's you know I usually like to make it look you know make it look like a light is kind of emanating from within my scenes, but um, you know in terms of value. But when you kind of play around with um, um, kind of ranges of tone and or temperature like this. This green is a little bit warm, right? So you have this blue next to that green, so it creates a, kind of another uh, kind of a layer of uh, kind of visual language when it comes to color. Well, I'm getting kind of well, crumbly bits of uh, this pad showing on here. When these pads, these pads last a really long time, the foam does. But when it goes, it just seems to kind of go all at once and crumble inward. Now I know these pads are really old because this is the old. Now they haven't been making these pads for a while, and they haven't been making this kind of just white printed ink thing. They started going with a sticker on top of there at one point in time, way back when. So these inks are really, really old. That's what you want out of our supplies, right? We want them to last. I believe in uh, things that last. I want everything to last, unfortunately, these days. In manufacturing, it seems like things just aren't made the way they <laughs> used to make them. I don't know if it's not, I'm not talking about the, the craft industries. They're not thinking that way, you know. They're not trying to make a pad that disintegrates, you know, quickly. But um, anyway. 20 years out of a pad, that's pretty good to me. I have zero complaints about something like that. All right, brushing off some of those crumbling little bits there, but yeah, when those pads go, they go. I'm saying goodbye to my pad here. Look at that right there. I think I have an extra replacement one for that. I'm gonna save my top here. Sometimes my top I can use for, you know, a palette or something like that, or you know, I, was, I might have a cracked uh, case from something, or lid. All right, so that's what we have right now. Now, after I did that green, I think I want to go back a little bit more. I'm going to hit it with a little bit more Prussian blue and come back into that. Sometimes I don't want it so green in some areas. I have this pen here, this is a manganese blue, and I was thinking about just rubbing it on there and kind of doing it that way. I don't think I will. Manganese blue is, as far as blue inks go, they don't have it in pad form, they don't have it in reinker form, they only had it in pen form. I'm trying to think of by far, it's my favorite blue. It's my favorite blue. I'm trying to think of if it's by far, by a large margin, and it might be. It's just a super bright light ink, you know. This one's getting dried out a little bit. I would add a little bit of water to the back of it to get it flowing again, but love it. 
I like light and bright. I like other colors of blue too, but you know, I would use that light bright color in conjunction with other ones. And if it was laid down here, there would be this little, it would increase the kind of the glowing aspect of this scene right here. Or the center nail, whatever you call it, swatch. Okay, I'm going back in now with this light blue. You can go back to colors that you've used, you know, before and kind of gone over. I'm just kind of reintroducing this. I thought this looks a little bit too green to me, but okay, I can cover it up a little bit more. I'm not looking to cover it up all up, but I just want to bring in some of this influence of this other blue back over the top of it, okay? I love um, this color light blue as well. Kind of medium, but very bright. I like dull too. Don't get me wrong. I don't like all just super bright. But I like them all in conjunction with one another. You have colors underneath your darker colors. The darker colors are still transparent, so you're you know, those lighter colors underneath are still going to be influencing what we see on the surface. So all that lighter tone of ink, you know, the aqua reinker fluid, okay, that's still playing a part or a key role in actually what we see too, okay? It's still a layer within this surface here that we're working with. All right, we've gone through all our blues and almost black. Oops, do I use a turquoise here yet? Let me use that turquoise. I'm a little... This is a cosmetic sponge for those that don't know. Really high quality um, foam too. It's very dense, okay. Yeah, let's try some of this, see if I like it. Uh, I kind of like it, I don't like it that much. I don't know if I like it enough to use it too much on the interior, a little bit too green, but I like it over this darker blue area. I think it's a little richer here. I don't know if you can tell. Eh, maybe a little bit from up here to down here. I didn't use it down here yet. The turquoise that is not a color that I use very often, so I doubt if I've ever reinked this. And this is just, you know, really saturated with ink. Kind of darker tones I didn't use as much. I, maybe with the blues I do, you know, like nighttime scenes or something like that. But like magenta colors and you know dark violet and things like that I, I don't use too much so in other words they stay fairly you know my pads of those colors you know are very very moist yeah this looks pretty good I like this turquoise now it's I'm starting to sell me on a more usage I guess and then this area right over here looks really nice what you think it looks very kind of deep and I don't know mysterious or something like that. I don't know. It's just, it's a deeper feeling, okay, to me. A deeper visual look. Yeah, actually I like that really quite a lot now. People used to ask me in workshops, eh, should I use this color? And I wouldn't say no, don't, or yes, you should. My thing is, and this is how I approach it for myself, if you're kind of curious about using something, lay it down a little bit, maybe in a darker area where it doesn't show up, and then apply a little bit more and more, and if you like it, you know, then add more, okay? It doesn't mean when you try something out it has to be like that, okay? You don't have to use that much. Just try a little bit somewhere. Try it in a darker area where it won't influence, you know, anything. And if you like it, then just keep using it. Kind of expand on that um, application. All right, I'm using it quite a bit. I liked it quite a bit. All right. I still have some of those little crumbly bits from that last uh, pad. Let me try getting some of that off. All right, this is black here. Let's just go back to that same tip that we were using before. Oh, wow, this area out here is really soaked. Look at my fingertips now from kind of holding my page. Uh, I'm trying to go like 
this instead of one like this, because I don't want a bunch of uh, fingerprints all over my scene at this point in time. If it does, just kind of blend them in a little bit, but I don't know. If you get a few fingerprints, don't really don't stress over it. I don't know, I can't tell you what to do. I, I, I get them online all the time. There's probably some in here, but it really doesn't bother me. I'm going to be putting some additional imagery on here anyway, and then I'll be doing some kind of uh, detail effects on there. By the time you get you know, through all that kind of process, you know, one little fingerprint or a couple fingerprints or a big one here or there, you know, I don't know. I don't find it to be, a, you know, kind of an obtrusive or intrusive mark, you know, as far as the, the visuals of the uh, overall piece. Some people focus in on their, you know, their little errors or whatever, or their perceived errors or whatever it is they've defined as a, as a mistake, you know, and, you know, that they can't get their mind off of it. Eh, that's understandable too. That's probably, they're probably good at things and they're that same type of notion as, you know, I don't know if it's perfectionism, it depends on what degree, but, um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's not something that I really worry about at all in stamping, or in my pieces. I'm kind of a perfectionist when it comes to my designs, I want things exactly perfectly right, but the stamping portion of it like this, I think it just come out a little bit more kind of a graceful, you know, if you don't kind of stress out about the little things, you know. I like that strong vignette, so I like to go in my corners by quite a bit. Dark corners, top right, bottom, bottom right, you know, left and right. Okay, it's kind of see, it's kind of creating a stronger vignette. The stronger you, the darker you take the perimeters. If you've retained areas of light in the in middle or somewhere in the interior, the lighter they will seem by contrast. Okay. There's no light in the scenes. There's only, you know, you know, the shade to define that light, right? All right. It's the first time I've used an 11 by 17, uh, you know, blotter paper here. I forgot I even had it. Uh, What's top and bottom? It's hard to tell. What's top and bottom doesn't really matter. Yeah, it looks kind of interesting. If this was huge, it could be like a nice abstraction. You know, 40 by 60 inches, like a painting above someone's bed or something like that. Or in a living room or something like that. Okay. Um, let's see here. We're going to stamp out our scene. And we're going to be doing it in black ink. Okay, let me see. Do I center this? Maybe I'll center it. All right, I think I'll do that. Black ink, okay. I am going to, this is fairly wet here and I got, I have a, pretty dark edge, so I'm going to use a little bit of rain grow fluid for my pad here, just to make sure I get a pretty strong high ink content impression, okay? This is using the Lakeside Cove Large here, all right, and I'm going to wipe off a little bit of this line here. I don't want this line to be too prominent. That line's in there for a reason when you're working on smaller scenes, but this larger one, I don't want that line here to be showing, you know, in the middle of the card. Or scene, piece, whatever. Okay, let's go about right here. All right, now the page is a little bit moist, so when you're working with um, wet into damp, you kind of have to let this kind of transfer over a little bit longer than you normally would. Uh, 
make an impression. Okay, let's take a look here. Okay. We have the areas to the side. Left and right. Overlap by about a quarter inch or so. You can go a little bit higher, lower too, if you want some variation. side of the lake or whatever it is. Okay, so there's our foundation there. You can kind of see now that's, of course, sky and this is surface, you know, and you have this area of the, uh, the water reflecting the sky. Let's see that. Put this up here, okay. Okay, that's it for the lake side. I can use this again. I'm gonna, this is such a large scene here. I'm going to use this lakeside reflections large in here. We're creating kind of this little inlet. Okay, let's go. This, there's a lot of surface area on this stamp here. I'm not going to use this in its entirety with any single impression, okay? I'm going to be using kind of chunks of it, okay? Something over here. Let's go about like so. What's that? I'm stamping it kind of in a darker area, which means there's a lot more ink in that area, so maybe. Press and hold for a little bit. Let it set up. Hmm. Eh, it's not as dark as I would have wanted it. I should have let it set up a little bit more. I mean, it's not too bad. Okay, I'm inking up the other side of it because I'm going to, you know, going to uh, do an impression of it on that side of the scene now. And I don't want it so symmetrical, you know, so I'm going to go a little bit higher with it over here. Can I tell you what? Why don't I just leave that right there for now? And while I do that, I'll... There's a piece of paper towel on that. I'll stamp this one out. This is the... Uh... Pines and Rocks, larger version. Pines and Rocks is 195G, and this is going to go down here. Okay. This is probably ready to come off. So, in the meantime, why don't we pull this one off? Eh, it's about the same darkness. No, maybe it's a little bit darker. I'm not sure as that one. <laughs> like I said, it's really moist down there. So, it is dark enough for me. Okay, got some foreground trees. Can you see that? How it's starting to kind of build this whole scene up. I wouldn't mind being there, you know? It's one of those things in scenic stamping. We kind of, you know, we can kind of uh, create areas that uh, we think it would be kind of cool to be at or to visit someday or whatnot.
here. Maybe this one I stamped a little bit lower, or did I? I'm not sure. Okay, I'll go. Oh, I like so. I'm overlapping the uh, this other impression a bit as well. Now remember, the scene can be done on, you know, quarter page, you know, standard card size too. a little bit more depth in here with some additional trees in the background. I'll do that in a minute here. Let's take care of these impressions first. My oak branch. Great as a bush coming from below or a nice overhang coming from above. design is been designed where it's kind of thicker over here but it's less more airy over here if you have something a little bit more kind of involved and complex going in the background then maybe you want something a little bit more airy but if you want something you know for more coverage or you want it all in there then you know you stamp a larger portion of it okay this I'm going to make it look like we are standing like on a ledge overlooking this area down here so we have this tree limb hanging from above into the scene. Like about like so. I love this tree in front of like a moon or something like that, you know, where you have bits of it going in front of it. Making the moon even more dramatic that way by kind of the contrast against it and something dark really close to you. It could be in sun or any kind of, you know. Um, source of light. Okay. That is really wet in there. I want it a little bit dark. It's it's doing that thing where it's resisting a touch. I, mean, I need even more ink or something like that. But I put a slathering of ink down like that. I am going to um, wait till some of this dries because I want to put in some shadows down here and I can just tell it's a little bit damp you know my impressions still in a couple of these areas okay. I'll probably go for about three impressions with this uh, oak branch okay that's good coming down. Yeah, something like that. I don't want to mirror this part right here too much. Okay, so now we have some of this foreground right there. This was foreground before, but this represents something a lot closer to us. All right, now let's see. I'm going to pause the video here when I get my, uh... oh. I was looking at my uh, desk here to see if I had a couple of the images that I wanted. Oh, here it is right here. I don't need to pause here. Here's the, uh, the pine row. And here's Pines and Rock Small, too. I was thinking, no, oh, maybe I could use that just to kind of add a little bit of uh, variation to uh, an existing uh, kind of area. So let's go for a little bit of scale here. Okay. This down here. Here or somewhere in here. Okay, maybe I'll go for right here. Yeah, 
Yeah, something like that. And it just, I don't know, it just varies this area here a little bit from that same one, two, three, you know, type of tree structure, you know, having kind of something else in there. One of the, the things about scenic stamps is, I mean, you could use the same image in one scene multiple times. Grass, textures, rocks, whatever. The thing is, you know, when you, after you do that, it's, um, the trick is, is that you don't want it to look like the same image has been used over and over and over again. You know, you don't want there to be such a, a strong pattern to it. And that's a little trick to, uh, you know, uh, stamping and repetition. Okay, this is the Prussian blue. It's that really dark blue. I'm going to go for one impression of it, and then I'm going to wipe off the bottom portion of it a little bit. Pretty good. And then I use a little bit less pressure and I take off some of the ink off here, but not as much as the bottom part. Okay. So hopefully you get with this kind of this thing where it's darker trees and you know, or, or lighter trees than black in the background and it's darker on the top and lighter on the bottom where we don't kind of eradicate all of that nice silhouette of these trees down here. Okay, yeah, see that? That gives us a little bit more depth right in there, all right? We get the background trees, but these trees in the foreground still show up because I blotted it a little bit and then I wiped it on the bottom, you know, to about the middle area. So we can still see a nice silhouette right there, okay? Little, I mean, that's certainly uh, effective and, um, very easy um, process there. Okay, so wipe off a little bit, or blot off, and then wipe off the bottom portion. Pretty good. And then take off more ink until you're about midway up, but you just take off less than you did on the bottom, so you get this transition of tones going from dark to light. You could do this in the foreground too. That oak branch could be stamped out in a blue, you know, or something like that, a dark blue and black, and you'll have kind of that aspect of depth showing up right in the foreground as well. Okay, let's see how effective those trees are back there. Dare I go for another one? I'm not really quite sure. Oh, there's still some ink on there. There's a little bit of ink on there. Let me try this right here. I'm going to blot off these trees down here, and I'm just going to go for a small portion of it. If I don't blot this off, then I'm going to have trees down here at the bottom of this. So just, this is your mask, you know? That was the easiest mask in the world that you'll ever do. So you can see all these processes here are all very easy processes, you know? This is the easiest form of masking that anyone will ever come across. But, I mean, hopefully this scene, you know, we don't want this scene to look like, oh, that scene was uh, super easy to do, or this piece, you know. We want it to look kind of complex, but all the, you know, the actual, in reality, the process of creating these things are, you know, very easy. This is a more in-depth um, version of something, just because, the, you know, the in app by eleven format, the full page format, but it's not a more complex technique or something like that, you know, uh, to do that. It's just more time consuming just because it's big. Okay, so anyway, see those trees back there? And what that represents is light. It's light that's bouncing off, you know, more distant things and it's coming, you know, that light is bouncing, you know, back to your eye and your eye is um, picking up, you know, that image, but that light has broken up several times, you know, or a lot in that transition, you know, that, tri uh, that trip to get back to your eye through moisture and things like that and the dust in the air and whatnot, you know, that's why things look kind of lighter and then more in, in the distance in this case. Now I'm putting some of these reflections down here, you know, how I did it this way. 
Now I'm just stamping them again this way. And I'm just, you know, masking off some of those rocks to get those trees down there. It's not a complex, more complex method, but you're getting more mileage out of your stamps, right? And I'm a firm believer in that too, in the design process. Can, how can this stamp be used? Or how is it going to be used? How can it maximize its kind of uh, potential? All right, so anyways, it's not a perfect mirror impression, but look at that. I think that looks really nice like that. No, there isn't a tree there, but who cares, you know? Uh, maybe it's a symbol it, that's a fallen tree in the past, but its shadow remains. <laughs> or its reflection remains or something like that. I'm joking right here, but anyways, but you can see this kind of starting to develop here. I wonder if this is... My fingers are so um, inky now. I can't even tell if I'm picking up ink. I, 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 okay, I was going to pause and add in some shadows down here. Let's just do it right now. Okay, we don't have to pause at all, see? Let's go right into it. We're going to go with, what color do we go with? Let's go with the Prussian blue, okay? There's a lot of Prussian blue on the outside perimeter here, but I'm going to hit some areas down here. That, Kind of a little bit worried. Prussian blue is awfully dark. Here, let me use this. This looks like a. I use blue on here. It's it, but it's completely dry. There's nothing on this tip right here. Okay. Well, okay, there is a little bit. I have to really squeeze it. But let's add in some shadows into the scene. What do you do? Let's go to the medium tone blue right here. Where do you add in shadows? This is one thing that can really kind of add that little extra punch into people's scenes after they get kind of the coloring process down and, uh, uh, you know, the compositional aspect of creating scenes down. But now, you know, they color everything, but a lot of times I see things and I think a little bit of shadow would have been good. And it's easy to do if you look at the scenes. There's shadows. Like on these rocks right here, you can see where the bottoms of them are darker than the tops, okay? There's shadows in the water down here. You know, same thing right here. See these areas of the rocks are shaded, but where is it light? Up there. Don't touch that with shadows, okay? But hit the shadows where you see shadows on the designs, okay? And you do that with more ink, okay? And that gives them more volume and mass and just visual weight in general. Here's my cracked pad. Good thing I... Uh, Kept that old. Now I can't even find the top that I just had there. Oh, here it is right here. Tossing this one out. Okay, let's go with this. It's medium blue, it's the number 10, the light blue from Marvy. Okay, but like down here where there's shadows and whatnot, I'm just going to add a little bit more shadowing. See how I'm doing this too? I'm kind of tilting this at an angle a little bit. Okay, I'm not going for it like this. I'm not adding shadows like that again. I'm just adding shadows like this, okay? In any given area, and that makes the process not precarious. I'm not going to get some kind of huge mark like, oh my gosh, I really messed it up because, you know, I'm just making the process a nice gradual one. Yeah, that black's a little bit wet, so I, I am just kind of smearing it a little bit, but let's smear, who cares? It's a little bit smeared. I, don't, I just don't feel like stopping, okay, too much. Okay, but see how I'm kind of doing this? I'm pulling back again. And so I've added a little bit of shadow area down here. Now see this area is a little light right there, but we have this object right here, chances are that there'd be some shadows down here. Okay, so flip it around this way. Ink up. Adding some tone in there making it a little bit dark. Now we can go into some darker blues, but I'm just starting off with a lighter one because this color here shows up already in this given area. It's subtle, okay? But we can always go darker, but, you know, get a feel for it first and test it out. See if you like it. See at the base of the rocks right down there, I'm just kind of adding in some more shadows. You'll be able to see it more when I go to my darker tone, like a bluer, you know, that 
Prussian blue. All right, let's move into it. Um, blue. It's kind of a navy blue. All right, same area, area in here, okay? Here's my touch that I'm going to be doing. Kind of like that, okay? Hmm. It's not as dark as I thought it would be. Gonna have to go with the Prussian and maybe even black, you know, for some shadows. Just to anchor down that Lakeside Reflections large image. Yeah, I'm smearing some of that black from the impression, so and I'll be a little bit careful around that. Adding some of the rocks. Russian blue. Use with caution, as they say, <laughs> because it's very, very dark. See, so I'm kind of adding some on my rocks, but not over all of them. Kind of adding them down here, but not up there. Okay, because there's more light on those ones. I mean, this is not light in there, but it's lighter than down here, okay? Because I, on, on the image, okay, you can see the areas that are darker. Leave the top parts light, okay? So I'm just adding some kind of right around in here. And that gives that image a visual weight. It also kind of turns the uh, objects in space, not physically, but just visually. You're, you're saying that there's some dimension to them, so you're saying that, you know, the tops of some of the rocks are lighter than the sides, you know, because of top lit lighting somewhere. You know, in this case, it's the sky. Okay, hitting some of this in here. Let's do it in black. While I'm at it, you know, the, the perimeter dried a little bit, so it's allowing me to get a little bit darker using this black because more of it is transferring to the uh, surface. So this is a good chance you can see right here. Okay, here's this side of the scene, this side. See how light it is over here in comparison to this side, but see how much nicer that kind of lighter or darker area looks now, you know, like that. Let's do that. Let's go and add a little bit more perimeter vignette. Uh, vignetting? A word. Vignette construction. Shadows around the base of the lake.
love having these trees like that. It's all that certain value of trees, but then it's darker on the edge, and it, it's kind of like the trees are kind of the tree line. I guess it's coming out of the darkness into the light, you know, where it's more visible. I love those types of transitions. transition of the undefined to the defined. Versifying black would have been great on these images too, but I would have really had to wait for quite a while for it to uh, to set up, you know, and dry on this paper. Sometimes it takes a really long time, but versifying would have given us really dark and detailed black impression of our objects. gives them opacity and kind of visual weight. Okay, let me see if I have a... Uh, I was thinking about some water pattern in here. And I'll show you how to kind of make it uh, kind of appear a little bit more shimmery. Finding my water pattern. Let me go grab that and uh, maybe another stamp. Okay, I was looking for my um, water pattern. Here's my water pattern. Small. I was just about to say I was looking for it, but couldn't find it. And I, it's always right in front of your face. It was just upside down, so I didn't recognize it. But I was thinking I always use that. I was thinking about using the Cloud Alto Cumulus stamp for some additional texture in here, especially down in this bottom portion, and we'll keep it subtle. Okay, so let's go with uh oh uh, let's go with a lighter color. Let's go with a let's try a salvia blue. I'm looking for my memento summer sky now. I can't find that. My desk is completely cluttered at this point in time. I haven't uh tidied up in a while. Um not that it takes too long to do, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, but this is a very pale uh, and dull color. Okay, it's not bright or anything. Let me check this. Ooh, that pad is wetter than I thought it was. Okay, let's go like this. I must have read this fairly recently. You know, in relation to how much I've used it. So if you have a super wet pad, then what I do is I ink up like this. And then I kind of wipe off a little bit. I don't want to really super strong impression of this, okay. Yeah, that'll be good. Okay, so let me go like this. Ink up a little bit, and then kind of evenly wipe off a little bit. All right, now this is going to be subtle, probably. We'll see. I, it'll just, I'm thinking it'll probably just show up in those lighter areas, and the darker areas, I don't think it's going to show up because it's we're just stamping it out in a, you know, lighter ink to begin with. I don't need to mask off any of my rocks or anything like that. It's just it's too light of a color, so I'm not really worried about that at all. Yeah, see that right there? It's just... You can barely see it right in here, right? Okay. And I have a smaller version of it, but maybe I'll just use this top portion of it again. I'll go like this. Okay. I might even blot it off a touch like that, and I'll go for some of these top portion impressions up here, just in terms of kind of a little bit more of a subtle texture, and it'll be a little bit more varied. And like I said, I, I usually use 
uh, my water pattern small, and I'll just go for several impressions of it. But let's do something a little bit different for this one. A mm, little bit more variation, maybe. Well, certainly for me, because I've used the other ones a lot, but you know, the water pattern. But so it just it gives it a little bit more textural, um, kind of, I don't know if it's dimension, but range, I guess. Okay, let's see here. I have my tiny rock small stamp here, and I'm talking about going for a little bit of extra dimension and texture. Let's do something with that. Okay, let's go with, uh, let's go with a couple colors. This color won't show up at all, or mostly. Let's just use it a few times just to kind of get in the swing of things. Well, I guess it shows up a little bit. Okay, right down in here. I, I think when these rocks dry, you won't be able to see, it, you know, very much of it. They tend to dry lighter, so sometimes you can see the impression when it's wet, but then when it dries, you know, it's practically invisible, and I think that's going to be the case with this one. But let's just get some down there anyway. Okay, that was stamping it out in the Caribbean blue. Let's try it in Prussian blue. I'm not gonna use the Prussian, well, I mean, I could use it in here. I'm not, I'll use it in kind of the darker areas first. Maybe down in the shadows of that area. Darker areas in the foreground, perhaps. Giving a little bit of layering to the um, Caribbean blue impressions. two tones of blue, darker impressions of it here, lighter impressions here. Because it's darker over here and it's lighter in the center, so, you know, there's lighter impressions of it in this, you know, in those lighter areas. And that's the, the concept of it, at least. Okay, let's go for um, some, maybe some darker impressions. This is using black, okay? So you see, you just, you know, I'm just, using the same colors that I use to tone in. This area out here is darker, so you stamp out something darker in the darker area, okay? You just go kind of one step darker or so, roughly, okay? There's always going to be some variation. That's good. In terms of textural variation, color variations, it's not like I'm going to stamp this out here in black and think, oh my god, I just ruined the entire scene. It's nothing like that. But that gives us a little bit more dimension. Textures, I love that type of thing, and it's an easy process. Just using that same rock. Three different colors, you know, Caribbean blue, Prussian blue, and black. For my color scheme, if you're doing the sunset scene, then maybe you stamp those out in uh, orange brown or something like that, or you know, colors of that sort. Colors that are related to the ones that you've laid down in your coloring process. Okay, let's see. Let's give the scene a little bit of a focal point. Kayaker here. Hmm. And I have to fit him onto this block here, so let me make sure that I get it on straight. Okay. I put him back 
here. It would make these um, well, shoreline trees smaller. If I put it back down here, then by scale, you're saying that those trees are much larger. Okay, so smaller, larger, um, by relation to this figure. If I put a sailboat in there, we would be seeing these, you know, these trees are very large, but I'll just be the kayaker here. I'm thinking right down here, kind of looking through that. I think it would look good. I don't think it would look good right in the middle. It's either like up here, it'd be kind of interesting. But I'm thinking down here in the foreground, like something like that. Maybe up here, <laughs> in that light. It's kind of like a, like a spotlight on the uh, the figure. You don't have to put anything down here. It's fine without. It kind of, uh, you do something like that, it becomes sort of like a very strong focal point, doesn't it? You know, it has something like that. If this was this size and I put that little figure somewhere, people's eyes would just land on that. You know, it would be like a visual anchor point or a focal point, I guess. Too. Yeah. All right, so this is done and uh, I'm going to take a break from it and come back to it and add in my little touches with lighting, you know, the uh, gel pen. Uh, I don't know if I'll use opaque white. I don't think I will, or bleed proof white. But um, certainly some uh, color box pigment ink in here to kind of give it that kind of mistier feel and whatnot. We get here, you know, this mist in the background or whatnot. Kind of interesting, but anyway, coloring, uh, impressions, um, shadows, and layering look pretty good. And maybe we'll even do some little detailed. Uh, shadow making types of things with some alcohol pens. I don't know if it really needs it. Everything seems to be fairly resolved, but these are kind of colors that we've used from our color scheme instead of using, you know, I didn't use gray, but I used black, so gray relates to that. So maybe I can go in here and add some shadows or like a shadow like at the base of that little canoeist or something like that. You know, this tip isn't going to be great for that, but using a little pen is perfect for that type of uh, touch. So maybe we'll do something like that. We'll see. Okay, so I'll give this a little bit of time to set up and dry and whatnot. But fun and uh, very basic, but very large too, by card making standard. Okay, I've come back to my scene after a few hours. Looks pretty good. I, I thought it would fade, kind of have a, a faded a more faded look than it does. Sometimes when you use that um, Adirondack light or certain brands of inks, um, at least in this process of, you know, the, uh, the multiple glazed uh, ink technique, um, some things that are laid down can kind of give it um, the end result when dried kind of a more I don't know, kind of a, a dull, frosted look to it. Now the great equalizer, which I always mention, is spray sealing your scenes, and it'll bring back the vibrancy and saturation of a freshly applied ink look, and uh, you know, that's the way you kind of get around, you know, some possible faded looking. It's, it's not really faded, it just dries dull, okay? I don't know, it's just whatever's in their binders um, from certain brands of inks. If you use just Marvy, I don't, I've never run across that um, issue. It looks, you know, very glossy and saturated and uh, the tone's nice and deep. I will spray this, but, um, but it's not looking too bad right now. Yeah, it's uh, uh, fairly deep and saturated. It will look even more so when sprayed, but uh, not too bad. Okay, so we have our pens here. Um, you can use various brands out there. This one's not the uh, the main brand, of course. Um, but uh, you know what ones I'm talking about. Um, they're all, I don't know, I find them all to be very good. 
Um, I haven't tried some of the ones that are really inexpensive. I, I, I want to get one of those sets, um, you know, like 80 pens for, you know, $40 or something like that, because I like all the, the lighter tones, but I don't know. I've always had good luck with uh, just about any type of pen out there. Um, these ones are alcohol. These are the La Plume Permanents. And, you know, one of the fun things about... Um, pens these days um, with the uh, popularity, I don't know, is it still popular, adult coloring books. Um, there's so many different uh, brands of like gel pens and um, permanent pens for people to color with and uh, I don't know, it really gives a nice choice for us. Okay, I'm going in here and I'm adding in some shadows into these rocks right here, okay? Now, it might look a little bit darker <laughs> than it would, just because it kind of dried a little bit dull, okay? Now, when I spray this, every th all the dye base things will look much um, darker, okay? Because the saturation will come back um, as if it is still wet, okay? It's like deep and, I don't know, kind of glazed looking. But anyways, what I'm doing is I'm going in and... Uh, into these rocks right here. I'm reiterating the shadow shading scheme within these rocks. So, like on this rock right, oops, sorry. So, I can just focus in. My focus seems to be going a little bit slower these days, but anyway, okay, you can see where this is kind of darker on the side of the rock, the vertical edges, but lighter on the top. I'm reiterating that with the pen, not on the stamp here, but on the piece of paper, so I would just color that in, and I would leave the lighter parts light. So, top portions remain light, bottom portions get a little bit of shade, okay? It's as really as simple as that. Now, what color do you go with? I kind of go with a color that I think is just one step darker than the existing tone that I've laid down, okay? You could go darker than that, but I think it's always nice to take things in a nice incremental fashion that we don't kind of uh, experience as many, um, I'd say, kind of uh, undesirable surprises, okay? I like a good surprise, or, you know, I don't want to have to be, have everything predictable, but I don't want to go in here and say, oh my god, that shadow is much too dark, all right? And then, you know, because you can't really lighten it up, there are certain things you can do to kind of minimize it somewhat, but I'd rather not have to do that. I'd rather just have a little bit more control over kind of the, uh, you know, the overall look to an extent. Now, if I'm experimenting around with certain types of color schemes that I've never used before, I don't need to have, you know, complete control over it, but... It's never a precarious kind of process when you're just really taking things as incrementally as I do, you know, and just going one step darker, one step a little bit darker than that one, and moving through your value scale kind of in a nice incremental fashion, kind of one notch at a time. If they were talking about kind of a value scale going from one is very light, you know, a zero would be white of the paper, and 10 being, let's say, black, you know, it's easier if you jump from 2 to 4 to 6 to 8 to 10 than if you go from 2 to 10, okay? It becomes a little bit more of a precarious type of uh, process when you do it that way. Not that it can't be done. You could just start off with 10. Sometimes I just go in with monochromatics, and that's really fun. All right, so just going in here, this is uh, kind of a light green. It's similar to... Uh, did I use? Oh, that pale green that I threw away. I forgot about throwing that away already. But anyway, it's, it's very similar, so it's using a similar tone, and this way I can kind of... See, I'm just kind of taking this in. Remember how I was kind of wiping these um, streaks in here with color? Why not do the same thing with a more controlled or smaller tool like that? Okay, so I'm just kind of going like that. And bringing in some tone. It'll look kind of streaky because that'll kind of stand out um, for a while, but when I spray it, it'll blend right back into the uh, the surface here. Okay, so I can kind of come in here and reiterate it in the sky a little bit. Okay. Get a little bit of shading on that kayaker there. How about a 
adding a little bit of tone to or something like that to these rocks. I don't know if it's moss or if it's the, just the lighting scheme of the scene giving it that look. Or supposed to be giving it that look. But see, I can kind of warm up that water a little bit more. Sorry if I'm going off screen here. Let's zoom out a little bit. But if I've left too much white, which I don't know if I left too much of it, but, or light, I can just kind of go in do it with a very light color. Why not do that? You know, why not use very light tones? Most people, when they're kind of attracted to colors, and naturally so, they're going for something more of a, you know, something a little bit darker than your, you know, 10% or I don't know, maybe this is a 5% gradation or something like that of green. But I like having my sets of pads, um, my sets of uh, inks and uh, things like gel pens and certainly alcohol pens. I like lighter values of them because I always start off with my lighter tones. They give me the most amount of coverage when I start moving into my darker tones. You know, it's kind of more perimeter oriented, so I don't use them as much. Oh, that one's really, that one's a little bit too dark. I did use that on here. You know, well, let me see. Maybe I can hit, you know, some of these shadows in there a little bit more with this darker blue. Shadows are oftentimes kind of brighter and darker versions of the color scheme. In this case, it's the lighting scheme within the scene, too. Uh, you know, uh, more so than, say, black, okay? You can certainly use black in the shadows, but I like to use color, okay, if there's... Um, this certain type of color scheme, you know, the lighting is illuminating things in the scene, then I like to go with that color because it's colored light that we're talking about. Not that I can't move into a uh, black tone or something like that, like I've done with the inks here, uh, the dye-based inks, but um, I like to start it off with the... Uh, the lighter, the lighter values within the color scheme as my shadow, my, you know, initial shadows. Okay, now this is gray, all right. Now, dive, um, permanent inks, watercolors, whatever, most types of inks are, you know, they're transparent, dye-based alcohol inks, whatnot. And so this gray, is probably not going to read as gray so much as it is like a cool gray if I'm going over blue because the blue from underneath is showing through. So, see this time, not just you don't have to just use one color for your shadows on your rocks. Why not use a few different colors that you've used in your color scheme? And it's just simply about matching kind of your pads that you've used. This, these two colors right here are real similar to, well, I threw away that other pad, but, um, it's, you know, it's kind of similar to that. Well, maybe not so much, but in terms of value, okay, this color blue right here is not too much darker or lighter than this blue here, okay? So you're kind of matching values. Values are the relative light and darkness of something. I think how beautiful that pen work made those rocks. I think those rocks look like they're glowing a little bit more, and there's kind of a, a nice mass to a volume to them, you might say. Okay, going down. How about some shadows on this uh, kayaker? You gotta kind of fill things in. If you have things that are. Um, like objects within your scene, and you have things kind of very modeled, toned in, and whatnot all throughout the scene. And if you stamp something out somewhere else that is not modeled, okay, like a figure or a house or something like that, or a cabin, structures, whatever, it looks kind of uh, unresolved. You have to put that same type of shading into something, even if the objects themselves already have shade in them. We don't know what color um, 
something's going to be. So these rocks right here, if I'm doing a you know warm sunset shining on these rocks, chances are those rocks are going to be like golden hues, reds, oranges, golds, or whatever, you know, sunshine, you know, the golden hour, so to say, you know. So even though I have the shading in there, you still have to anchor it a little bit more. That would be my recommendation, at least, with some of that color that's, you know, the main influence, whatever color's influencing your scene. Okay, and this one, it's that kind of warm, you know, tone blue. Okay, now well, let's see here. I'm taking a look, and I definitely have some things to do on here, but um, I'm trying to decide if I want anything else. That Versafine's still going through my mind. Um, I thought about not doing it, but I was thinking this thing might be able to handle it still if I kind of like like a versifying black over here and that would give me see this tree rare branch isn't too dark it'll get darker um if i spray you know spray seal this um with an acrylic spray or something like that you know and thus the imagery will be darker but this would be really dark and i think it would look kind of nice up there but I can't use that versifying black on here, otherwise I'm not going to be able to do my kind of special effect type of things until, I don't know, a day from now or something like that. And I want to do it now. Here's my pigment ink, my frost white pigment ink, okay? You can use just about any brand out there. But if you're doing this process, don't start off with brilliance. It dries too fast, okay? There might be some other brands of inks out there, um, pigment inks that are known for drying very quickly, or or if you want to stamp something onto uh, glossy paper, it dries, and that's brilliance, okay? The color box is one of those that has a reputation for not drying on glossy cardstock, which this is, of course, but I'm not stamping imagery on there, okay, and putting a thick application of this ink, I'm putting a very thin application of this ink. You can see my where this is kind of dented in, right? This is a 20-year-old pad, and it's, I might have re-inked it once, but it's very, very dry. All right, so I'm taking this Q-tip here. When I was doing this, I was kind of unraveling the, uh, the tip of it here just to make it a little bit softer, okay? Take it in some ink. Now this is very dry, okay? You don't do this on yours. Chances are it's very wet. Most pigment inks are, you know, because we don't just use them for over the course of 20 years when it dries out like mine. So if it is, just put a tiny tab, you know, just touch it to the surface because you're going to be picking up a lot of ink. And then what you're going to do is you're going to blot off a lot of it, okay? I don't need to blot mine off, you know, too much because it is so dry and I'm not really getting too much ink off of there. But you want to have, uh, let's see, I'll show you what I'm doing here. So I'm kind of blotting this off to where, you know, it's kind of removing a lot of that ink. If you see a big, huge blob of ink, don't use that on your scene. What you want to do is you want to get this to where it's, it's very dry and light, where you're dry brush tapping this into it, okay? Now, a lot of people try to rush this and they say, oh my god, that's such a precarious and hard technique. You know what it is? It's just because they use too much ink on it, okay? That's the only thing that makes this hard, is if you ink it up, and remember, everyone's, this one is super wet, okay? And this Hero Hughes one is, it's practically a brand new pad. I barely used it. That has a lot of ink on it. I can use it, but I'm just going to just barely dab into that and see it leaves, you know, a pretty good, you know, blob of ink. I don't know. I, I tapped quite a bit of it off, but just don't start off with too much, okay? And it becomes very easy because when you tap down like this, okay, well, that's showing up quite a bit. Let me get some more of it off. All right. Eh, a little bit too much, okay? <laughs> you can erase it right off on glossy, it comes right off. 
Let me take off a little bit more of this ink. I did, I tabbed down on that hero hues just to kind of make a point of um, how much ink uh, most people kind of start off with. Unless I'm right next to him at a demo table or something like that, then I can say, okay, now use it or something like that when you can barely, you know, see it being applied. All right, where do I use some of this stuff? We have these zones of light in here, and that's kind of where I start this off. I mean, what this represents is mist, and if you can see mist in the air, it means that light is hitting it, right? So over here in the shadows, there's no light over here, so chances are you're not going to be able to see this kind of this almost invisible vapor in the sky, you know, the air. You only see it where there's light areas, so if you retain some lighter areas, this all kind of makes sense as far as um, what's happening in here visually. If I use it, if everything got this dark um, all throughout the scene, then this mist kind of looks out of place because you're seeing that, I don't know, it's just a, kind of a weird um, effect, okay? I don't know, maybe if that's a haunted thing and it's a ghost at night or something like that, then that's fine, you know? It's not light being reflected, you know? It's, you know, light emanating from within some kind of apparition, but... Anyway... Apart from that, I'm adding in this little tone in here, and what this is doing is it's creating a little bit of variation. And this Q-tip right here is a little bit tight. I, I don't know. Q-tip is a pretty good brand out there as far as this goes. Um, it's nice and soft and, you know, like cotton, not the acrylic on this one. I don't know, maybe this is a different brand. Okay, but take a look at these trees back here. Let's give them a little bit more distance and variation by tapping a little of this ink on the top, okay? Let me see if I can do one on one side <clears throat> and none on the other, and you'll see kind of, hopefully, you'll be able to see a little bit of a change here, okay? I always get in trouble when I kind of come in too close because then I forget, you know. I have a very small window underneath my camera lens here and I ended up working off that scene or something like that, so I'll try to uh, be more conscientious, especially I haven't done video in a while. I kind of forget uh, what I'm doing in them. But see, as you can see that kind of, see that side of the tree and that side of the tree? They're different, right? But I think that is the little type of uh, variation that makes this scene, this type of look or whatever, really fun and effective. See that little tone that I put down there? I'm saying that there's like some cloud or something like that, some vapor down below. One of the things that people do when they get into this is they do it everywhere, okay? And then the whole thing is one big blob in the middle, okay? And if it is and you don't like it, just wipe it off. Take a you know, paper towel and just wipe it right off. It will come off the glossy, okay? As long as it's not the brilliance one, okay? But take a look at this tree back here, okay? And let's put a little bit of tone on it. See, now this is a completely easy process, right? Why? Because when I put a tap here, see like that, I can do this, do this in the darkest of areas right there, and nothing shows up. But if I use it more and more and more, then there it is, okay? See, it's just barely showing up, and there's no precarious type of thing. Let's say that there's, you know, there's just a little bit of a, a streak in here. Now, I'm not saying that this is where I'm going to put it, you know, everywhere, but let's say there's a little bit of cloud there. See, I can just start building it up, and it's just building up very gradually, right? Because it's so dry on here, so if you make it kind of a dry process, it is completely easy to control the more I tap. Let's say I wanted to, this tree, see the light is coming from in here. Let's put a little bit of lighting on this side of the tree, right? Let's see, I'll show you how easy it is. A couple taps, you don't see anything happening at that tree, right? So I'm going to put more. Now at some point in time, I do need to re-ink this because there's, you know, there's barely any ink on here, okay? But see, I don't know how many times have I done that, 20 taps or something like that? and I start to see a little bit of change right there, okay? And that's where you have complete control over it. It's just like starting off with light-colored inks. Light-colored inks, you can just practically do whatever you want because it is so light. Well, I'm starting with a very light, um, dry 
tip here, okay? Instead of starting light, you know, with the color of my ink, I'm just starting very dry with the color of my white ink now, okay? So in other words, just kind of take it nice and slow. Don't rush things and try to have things kind of develop instantly. You see that? A little change in hue right in there. Okay. I can add a little bit more. And it puts a little bit of a kind of a veil of mist in the background. This is what they always do in movies. You go, anytime people are walking through like a forest or something like that, you always see, you know, some guys in the background with that one of those misting, you know, smoke machines, okay? And that's all I'm doing here. I'm kind of, it gives it more atmosphere. And sometimes if you have kind of mist in the background of a motion picture, it gives that, it makes the scene more dynamic because, you know, that mist is kind of moving, you know, against all those static trees or whatever that you have in there. Right now, see, this is kind of coming alive a little bit. There's this illumination happening within here. You know, that background light is um, influencing what you see in here. So that's a simple, easy way to do lighting. Retain some of your light areas, and then whatever imagery you have in there, put a little bit of pigment ink, okay? That's a way to introduce kind of a softness to things. Things look soft now within there, right? And if you want to keep adding more, you just kind of build it up, you know. But don't try to build it up so fast, you know. Just put a little bit here and there and just add more accordingly if you add too much. That's a little bit too much right in there, isn't it? Or you can just kind of dab it off and it's gone. There can be nothing easier. That's my entire philosophy in terms of my processes. I keep things easy, but it doesn't mean that I rush it, okay? In fact, it's the opposite. I think when you don't rush things, things become much easier, and you get a faster result because you don't have to kind of um, try to undo an undesirable di desirable mark because it just never appears, you know, to begin with, you know? Or, you know, if you do get an undesirable mark or something like that, it's it's not as frequent <laughs> I mean, I get them in mind, and I have to kind of do some repair work and everything like that. It happens all the time, but I'd rather do it in the spirit of experimentation, like I said before, than in the spirit of hurriedness, okay? So that's kind of giving it a little bit of atmosphere, right? Let's add a little bit more over here, okay? Putting it at the base of some trees, you know, like some mist that's creeping in from, you know, beyond. But see that? That's where you get your little variation. Okay, you see it right here? Uh, let's see, here we go. In between these trees, and I kind of add a little bit down like that, in between them. I don't put it everywhere. This is tree right here. Half of it has some of it, and half of it doesn't. Now, there is no thing such as, you know, when doing this, like, should I do that branch there? Or if I do, will it ruin it? That's it's not like that at all. It's not that kind of a precarious type of exercise, okay? See these trees down here? I mean, this looks fine down here as, as is, but let's put a little bit of, ooh, I have a little bit too much there. Let's blot some of it off. Go in here and add a little bit of this mist, you know? It's always kind of a cool look when you go to some body of water early in the morning and see that kind of mist rising off the surface. It creates some um, atmosphere and uh, a really neat visual, right? Okay, let's put some right over here too. So I haven't re-inked this, you know, very often. This, you know, the Q-tip here, the swab. Because I keep using a, a very, very dry incarnation of it, okay? It's barely on there, so it's not really opaque. It's a translucent layer that I'm layering, laying down. Here's this oak branch up here, all right? Let's put this 
into a little bit of light. I'm not saying that this is fog up here, but I'm saying that some of this branch is getting illuminated, right? So I can create this oscillation of light and dark within an object. Okay, so some of it, sorry, some of it is a little bit lighter than other areas, okay? And I think that's fun, you know, having that variation in there. Okay, something like that. See, that's kind of creating a softer, lighter um, area within the image, okay? All right. Um, I need a room. This is such a big thing when I'm moving this scene up. Uh, you know, areas of my desk are getting blocking it. Okay, let's see down here, okay? Um, we have that kind of fog and mist on the surface up there. Let's put some right in here, okay? This looks pretty good to me as is, but I'll show you what this can do. Okay, see that rock right there? See how I'm putting a little bit of fog and shade right at the base of it, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm kind of creating this entity, you know, mist. And it's kind of, I'm putting some right behind that tree right there, okay? And then I bring it around to the front of this rock right here. It's getting a little bit too light. I'll just kind of blot some of it out. But I'm putting it kind of, you know, here. I'll put it some in the background right in here. And then I'm kind of coming around and I'm putting it in the front of these rocks, right? So what we're doing with that is you're enveloping something in a substance, you know, fog, mist, moisture. But what that does is it kind of envelops it in light because you're saying that light is coming in here and it's coming, coming, creeping around something. So you kind of introduce this kinesthetic um, aspect to your scene. So things are visual in here, right? But when you do this, you're kind of putting something in a you know, an object surrounded by light, and it's kind of enveloping it, and it looks kind of inviting. There's something of very, I don't know, comfortable about it. You know, it's not threatening. You know, it's it's light, you know. Things like to be in the light, you know, so to speak, right? Can you see that? No, this isn't really... Okay, oops. Sorry. Working off. All right, this large scene's getting driving me nuts on my table here because I want to move this up, but everything's blocking it up there. I have a ton of stamps that I need to clean off. Okay, here we go. See that? It's too much. So I'm just going to work it a little bit. Yeah, there's too much. There's too much ink on my thing here, so watch this. See that? That removed it, right? I use my fingers as kind of a removal ink, you know, pigment ink removal tool. But look at that. See that? Yeah, okay. Here, let me blot this off a little bit. I have too much ink on this tip here. Okay. There we go. Start it up again. I'll show you what this looks like, you know, from a more distance. Okay. The glare. That's what that looks like. See that little passageway right here with that fog and mist? It gives it more dimension, doesn't it? You know, doesn't it? I think it looks more three dimensional having something like that. Now, let's do the same thing for this object right here. Let's keep the 
uh, let's create a consistency with our kind of elements that we have in here, okay? So here, I'm gonna try to get that all in the scene here. You can see that area right there. Let's put this little figure here. And let's put them in a little bit of that mist. Don't do it over the whole thing. Have it, you know, some here and some there. Maybe at the base of the uh, kayak. Put a little on the board, or too. Maybe some light is hitting it, right? See that? Now, this image has a little bit more character, I believe. You know, it's not just a black print of something. Yeah. Let's see if I can focus that. Oh, come on. I don't know, is that as close as I, I should be able to? Okay, here, just do it more slowly. And stay focused. But see that image? Doesn't that image look a lot more, I don't know, I guess rich in terms of the value scheme at least. And I did color it a little bit. It'd be interesting to put that, like a little red jacket on that character amongst kind of a cooler scheme. I tell you what, red would be a little bit too extreme, but let's do something warm. Okay, let's do this little biscuit, is what this ink is called. Put them in a little bit of biscuit. It'd be like the little warmth within the scene. I guess some of that green is a little bit warm. Ah, that doesn't even show up, that biscuit. Let's go a little bit um, darker. I think there was one called... Oh, okay, sepia. Ah, let's try the sepia. Yeah, let's put a little sepia jacket on them. Hoodie or whatever. All right. Let's take a look here. See that? Okay, let's do that. Okay, if I like it, I can add some more. I don't think it really needs too much more, but I think that looks pretty good. But see how I've kind of left it off the front? Uh, the figure isn't really in it. Unless I'm doing a really super foggy scene, you know, and I just want to make a point, I just kind of slather everything out, you know, I usually oscillate objects. Okay, let's look at that tree there. If you want to make that tree a little bit more dimensional, then uh, on the sides of the tree, facing the light. Maybe a few of the branches are catching some of that light, maybe just a touch. Okay. So we have that. See that little bit of a, a lightening of that edge. Of those, uh, tree branches. Okay, let's put some more mist on the lake's surface. Something like that. I don't know. I mean, for me, I'm mean, doing something like this. It it becomes a more and more inviting, okay, in terms of like a, I guess during the process, it's like a little vacation in your mind. Like you are visiting this area and you're thinking if you go to a certain area, you know, um, I'm talking actually go somewhere. Let's say we go somewhere, we're at the beach at noon, but, you know, you can also say, oh my gosh, how grand would this beach be, or something like this, if it was now sunset, if I'm looking at it at sunset. The thing about scenic stamping, you can do whatever composition you're doing and make it whatever time of day or whatever color water you like or anything, you can totally customize your own world. And, you know, getting into something like this, I love seeing the kind of well, atmospheric things um, at different locations that I've been to, and I love it when you're kind of in a place where you're very aware of um, the space in between the objects, you know, like at sunset, you might not be aware of all that dust and smog or whatever, you know, if you're in a certain area during the daytime, I'll let you know that it's, you know, you could smell it maybe or something like that. Um, but at sunset time, you know, when you hear those golden lights hitting all that area, it, it makes you very aware of that space in between things because it illuminates with golden light, you know, dust in the air, smog, moisture, whatever, okay? 
like this is moisture in the air. It's, um, you know, you can kind of feel the scene. And that's what I really like about adding these types of little things within a scene, um, like that. You see, you add whatever elements you really like. Now, unfortunately, I hardly ever get up early enough to see kind of like fog on a lake or something like that. I'm totally a, more of a night person, but I don't know, I guess you can see it at night sometimes, but sometimes, like, and, you know, I remember some visuals, like, walking through, uh, at night, back from a uh, very late photography class, and I was walking next to the uh, football practice field at the university, and uh, the whole thing was just blanketed in, like, a foot-high hovering um, fog, you know? I don't know, it makes a kind of a mental impact uh, on me seeing things like that. Or certainly looks beautiful sunsets maybe, you know, ones that stand out more than others or something like that. It might be very memorable. Different colors. Yeah. I remember some colors were kind of like that, or like this one time that I was looking at. All right. Anyways. Okay, I think that looks pretty good as far as the pigment ink goes. I didn't feel like it needed too much. You know, there were certain types of tonal gradations that were already working on it. So this is a 10 point paper, by the way. I always tell people these days, if you're gonna go with a, a ream of paper, 200 sheets, um, go for the 12 point, you know. You have 200 pieces of full-size paper, you can cut them down to smaller sizes, meaning you'll come out of a, that type of pack with, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, pieces of paper, but for a ream of paper over the course, you know, for some 200 sheets, you know, it's only like $5 more to get a thicker paper. And See, this is kind of buckling because of how much ink that I've put on there. You can see it like that. See, it's kind of bending. But anyways, okay, let's go back to some other uh, additional touches in here. We have um, kind of this color right here. And I have this pack of shuttle art gel pens, and it's a pack of 180 colors and 180 refills. I bought it for $20. I think it's now like $30 or something like that. But um even so you know that's very inexpensive for you know that much of a selection of uh, gel pens in my opinion Let me see. okay these colors okay now here's a signo um uniball um white gel pen but these are the shuttle art ones but shuttle art you know with so many colors i can these are colors out of my color scheme right so i can go in here and add in some little fine touches into here, okay? Now, let's take a look here. I always have a good experience with my shuttle art, Signo, I'm sorry, Signo. Uh, then you can see where all that white ink was. Now it's just in that little area because I've been using it a very long time and I've used up all that ink. So meaning these pens don't clog on me very often like some gel pens have done in the past. The shuttle R one's been fantastic. Again, thank you to all um, adult coloring book people for <laughs> creating that kind of market where, you know, these gigantic um, pen incarnation, pen set incarnations are out there. Okay, now see where I'm doing these little white gel pens? I'm doing it in a light area where it just barely shows up, right? And that kind of gets me in the swing of things a little bit. And then as I move out, and what this is doing is I'm kind of trading this uh, kind of idea of little shimmering, little specular light um, details on this uh, surface here. So I'm just going in and creating another little texture on top of things. Remember how we did the uh, cloud alto cumulus in here? We have all these little textures on here. Well, 
what I like to do sometimes is I go on these little textures in here and I'll just highlight some of them. So it kind of provides me a little bit of a structure to go in. I guess that the Alto Cumulus kind of represents um, a reflection from the sky, but it also could be little ripples in the water and whatnot. And again, if you don't like some type of mark that you've laid down with your gel pen, just rub it right off. You don't have to do it while it's dry either. I mean, while it's wet. You can also just rub it right on off if it's uh, dry. It comes right off glossy paper, just very easy. Okay, but anyways, adding this little surface down here creates a little bit of a shimmer, and I, you know, for me, when we're talking about water, it makes it a little bit more inviting, you know, it sparkles, you know, with, uh, I don't know, cleanliness and kind of like magic or whatnot. Let's take a look here. See it down in here? I'm laying it right on top of some of those textures in here. Up around here, I just kind of dissipated it a little bit. I have it a little more condensed here, and as it moves out into the darkness, you wouldn't see kind of sparkly water, right? Because light isn't hitting it in the shadow areas. Okay, now, where would I put it on those rocks, okay? Are those rocks a little bit too dark for a white, you know, bright highlight? I think so, because they're very dark in there. So, that's where things like these colored gel pens come in handy, okay? Instead of putting a white highlight in here, I could put, you know, blue highlight, okay? Something like that. So I'm just staying within my color scheme, okay? And where do you put it? Again, it's really quite simple. Just reference the designs. You might not have the wood version of it, but stamp it out, or you can see it on here. There's lighter areas to these rocks right here, right? If it's a cabin, it's usually on the rooftop or something like that, you know? But that's where I'm laying some highlights. Now, I'm not doing it, in, you know, real strong, you know, like, you know, doing some outline of everything, okay? I might just add a few, okay? So, all right, I need to zoom in a little bit more. When we're talking about adding, like, three dots to something, it's kind of hard to show unless you're zoomed in quite a bit. But see here, I can put these little highlights on tops of some of these areas or objects. And see, this is just one step lighter than that rock down there, okay? Remember how I kind of worked from one step lighter, you know, incremental steps with my ink, you know, not taking a big jump? I'm not taking a big jump. This is not going super light on something very dark, okay? So I can might just put a couple little dots here and there, but look at that. There you get that kind of subtle, almost kind of haunting lighting in here, okay? So you can see kind of how effective that can be, having those little dots on there like that, all right? Well, we're looking really close, you know, but you know, when you hold it at, at arm's distance, that's what it looks like. So we can tell that there's some dimension on on there. And if you like it, you can always add more, or if you do want to add white, then you certainly can. But what I'm saying right now is, if you're kind of learning it, it's going to be, you know, you don't, you don't want it to become really precarious, just add a couple dots, you know. It's, and if you don't like it, it just rubs right on. Let's say, oh, I don't like that little dot right there. Then it's gone, you know. So it's not a precarious type of thing at all. I wouldn't do something that's real difficult. That's not my idea of fun. I'm not employing some sort of real super, you know, technical type of thing. My whole thing is every step of the way to make it as easy as possible and foolproof and whatnot as I can make it. But just don't make it a super, you know, fast process, okay? So here it is on these rocks. See those little highlights? There's a few more of them. I don't know if you can tell. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. There we go. Okay, there's a few more right here. And there's less here. There's none up here because it's so dark, but see? A little bit more. A little less. A little less. See, I kind of spread about the darts, dots right there. 
you know, because it's uh, it's darker in there, so you wouldn't have as much reflective light, okay? Let's take a look at it in here, you know, you can put a few little highlights coming into the water over here where it's darker, okay? Instead of doing it with the white, do it with a few little things of blue, you know, light blue. Uh, uh, I don't know, this is a pretty light green. Yeah, you can see it a little bit. It's a very subtle color, okay. Done like this, at least. But hopefully it creates a little bit of a shimmering effect. We have that little bit of a warm highlight now in the scene, okay. But you can't really tell where I'm doing it, can you? And that's good, because that's my whole idea of it. I just keep it, you know, a little bit lighter than what's underneath it. See, if I put it out here, it shows up really strong, right? There, it's gone, okay? All right. all white if you want to. If you leave kind of a lighter touch, it'll give you a smaller dot usually, okay? If you want to leave a larger star, then kind of scribble it and don't hit it, you know, hard. In my classes sometimes, I saw people doing this, you know, I'm thinking, ah, oh, that's not a really good I, technique, maybe, you know, kind of leaves a little like a comma instead of like a little dot. Not that that's bad, you know, to have a little bit of a, I don't know, whatever kind of impression, expressionistic types of, you know, marks within your scene, but... Um, when people do this, they always kind of, when they first start doing it, all of their dots are completely evenly spaced. It's kind of, you have to kind of cluster them a little bit and put a couple night next to each other, you know, otherwise it looks kind of, um, there's too much of a, like, a predictable pattern to it, you know. I, I, I like a little bit more variation here. So see, just as I was putting some dots down here to represent kind of reflected light, you know, crepusc uh, not crepuscular, but specular lighting, now we have it up here in the sky, and that represents um, stars. Let's go on. Let's do... There's variation, you know, stars aren't all the same in color or whatever, right? So this one right here, that really stands out a little bit more right there, right? Some stars are brighter. Maybe they're younger or closer to us, you know? Maybe one of them isn't, isn't a star. Maybe it's a planet or something like that. I don't know moons of Jupiter. See, some of these I'm making a little bit larger, so I do a little... Sorry. So I do a little scribble like that, you know. Would there be so many stars at you know, this time of day? Well, no. But would I like there to be, you know? If I was here? Yeah, absolutely. I love kind of that. I love kind of that, I don't know, like maybe more twilight light than sunset. I love sunsets too, but I, I love the twilight even. I think even more that light that's kind of still hovering around 
after sunset. Sometimes there's greens or whatever, but it'd be really cool if there was really a, a, a you know, a sky full of stars at the same time as that. So create the scenes, create the types of uh, situations that you would like to experience or be in. And I know um, when you're, if you're a beginner to scenic stamping or something like that, you're, you know, the questions that you're asking yourself um, as you're doing them, you're, you're, you know, you're processing things. You're thinking, should I do another stamp here or should I color this? Should I use this color or whatever? And that's, yeah, that's what you should be doing, you know? And I do it too, but the thing that I'm also thinking more in my mind when I do my scene is, is um, I'm making one star kind of glow here. And what I'm asking myself is, well, you know, if I was in this scene, what would I like to see? What would be the ideal kind of a uh, um, situation um, for that setting? Would it be sunset? Would there be stars in the sky? Would there be sunset with stars, you know, or something like that? Northern lights, whatever. Okay, so we have those little glowing stars up there. Maybe I'll put a glowing star kind of within these branches right here. Maybe I'll put a big glowing little area of ink right in there like that. Now nah, it's too much, isn't it? Let's blot it down a little bit. There we go, that's better. <laughs> All right, why don't we do some of that down here in the water too? I don't know, crepuscular light. I, I guess they could be kind of glowing and a little bit glary, you know. Why not? Let's make the, you know, some of these areas down here, some of these little dots down here really sparkle. It's kind of creating a kind of a magical, I don't know, what do you call it when you go out on a kayak? A magical row, I guess? Okay, so create some little shimmering light around that kayak or wouldn't it be spectacular to uh, to be in that situation, their place right there. All right, so there is a full-size scene. Believe it or not, it's a simple composition, okay? It, it's not really complex and it's, it's only just large, okay? But we're talking about, there's the Lakeside Cove here, okay? And let's say this was the scene right here. This is about, you know, a four by six or a four and a quarter by five and a half would be about right there, okay? I could put that kayaker could have been right in here. This branch could have come down a little bit lower and I could have some foreground trees right here. So you can do it much smaller if you want to. Um, I don't know, I just wanted to do a large scene. I haven't stamped uh, enough lately and I just wanted to do some kind of large format scene, but I don't want to uh, think about it too much. I just wanted to uh, get it down. And I've done this scene before, but I, I don't think I had it in a, uh, a video format uh, yet. So I thought I'd get it down. All the colors were really super easy to apply because of that first color being used um, in the incarnation of a re inker as opposed to constantly tapping my tip into a pad and applying a little bit of ink, tapping a little bit, tapping a little bit. Instead, I had you know a pretty decent amount in my tip right near my sponge tip, and it gave me practically full coverage. I think I had to re ink it maybe once or something like that, but um, anyway. Very easy to do, just you have a lot more area to apply. And I just used, you, you know, I kind of reiterated kind of all of my concepts in this one scene here in terms of ease of use and uh, 
kind of making you know the entire process and each step of the process you know the least amount of uh, kind of uh, I don't know precarious types of things you could run into and it's all around just avoiding kind of rushing um, each step okay and making it as easy as possible full proof, full proof as possible and just fun to do you know because you can think about kind of the emotional aspects of your scene and the content of it as opposed to the technical aspect of kind of employing those techniques you know if just keep it kind of nice and easy you know your scene will develop and it'll about develop chances are much quicker than trying to fight off um, you know kind of a, a precarious type of uh, process that you are employing which makes it less enjoyable to kind of get you on edge instead of just kind of you know kind of losing yourself in a scene and I don't know kind of emotionally you know being enveloped by that uh, scene that you've created so anyways so what I'm going to do now is I'll spray this and that is going to be the result that you would have seen at the beginning of the video in the introduction so anyway so if you made it through this video thanks so much for watching I really enjoyed doing this one and I don't know these are a lot of my oldest designs right here and uh, it's a composition that I've done before a few times maybe not so much in the uh, full sheet size but you know, you do these compositions and color schemes and uh, the, you employ the, some of the same processes, but the scenes, you know, with the variation that can happen during the entire process, you always get kind of a different result every time. And that's one of the beauties of uh, stamping, in my opinion. Um, I have a pretty good idea what I'm going to get, but, uh, you know, not completely in terms of the end result. So. Anyways, um, I don't think I'm going to use any of that Versafine on here. I think I'm just going to spray that, and uh, that'll be done. So, anyways, thanks again.